All right, good morning. Welcome to Web3 Wednesdays, where we chat through some of the complex and nuanced topics in crypto and Web3 at large so that you can stay ahead of the curve. So today I'm joined by Charles Smith. He's the founder of Nifty Island. It's an open social gaming platform with a unique take on the problem of artificial digital scarcity in Web3, namely that they don't believe in digital scarcity, an advocate for a world of abundance with unlimited digital land. So Nifty Island, with a passionate community of builders and players behind it, frequently comes up in conversations we have with other creator-focused guilds. So Charles' experience across the space in both building broad communities as well as in developing some of these Web3 gaming projects makes him a fantastic resource for tapping into really niche ideas around user-generated content and digital land. And so we're keen to get his take on the matter. Charles, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sam. Appreciate you. Good to be here. All right. Well, let's jump right into it. Okay. So the status quo in Web3 gaming right now, as we all know, right, is that virtual land is artificially scarce. And so this old ethos of location, location, location seems to have been kind of forcibly mapped, you know, into the digital era. And so I'm particularly excited myself to have this conversation because, you know, I think you and I personally align really well on this. Um, I, I think that personally digital land scarcity is the default is almost kind of a lazy cop out. Uh, and it kind of fails to capture some of the really creative spirit that you can do in a, a digital scale. So, you know, us over at Playground Labs, even we have multiple games under development that prioritize this gameplay idea of digital unlimited land, you know, and the secondary effects that kind of go with it. So I know that your work at Nifty Island has been overwhelmingly in that same direction. And so I'd really love to hear from you, you know, and from a, both a personal and a commercial standpoint, you know, what are your angles on that space? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we think the kind of status quo or the direction that most metaverse projects have gone in is really doesn't make much sense. Uh, and I think maybe the first thing to discuss is sort of like why we're in the status quo, like why is it that things are like this? And what's really, I think, clear is that no one has really reasoned about scarce land and made a compelling argument for why it improves the user experience dramatically. Like why does having a finite plot of land or a finite grid map make a game better? Why should a game world have a constrained amount of territory you can build on and play games on? Etc. It's not what we see in the traditional gaming space. It's not what we see in Roblox or Minecraft or World of Warcraft, etc. It's not. It's it's not the model. And why are we doing it? So I think first we're not doing it because we've reasoned from first principles and decided it's the best thing to do. It's largely just a compelling meme that's gotten out of control. So Decentraland did it as an experiment, and it caught on, and it became and land the land and tokens around it became a sort of meme stock for exposure to the metaverse. Like it captured a narrative and people have pumped it full of value. And that's kind of why we're talking about it. So there's now a bunch of value, hypothetical value that's been assigned to these uh, assets. And so people are kind of reasoning backwards as to why they make sense. And people will assign metaphors like, oh, it's like a city, you know, it's like a, it's like a city, but in a digital space. And so, you know, people will want to own things on the high street or downtown. People will value having land that, you know, attracts an audience because foot traffic is going by, something like that. Or you'll want to have proximity to other compelling content. And that metaphor really breaks down, I think, uh, pretty quickly. So in a digital space, there's no need for kind of foot traffic. People aren't navigating from space to space by way of like travel transport by like bus or foot or subway you can just teleport from place to place and so the value that is there is about is around like discoverability of content and um and your ability to host great content just like having the space to do it like these things are real but they don't have to exist in continuous geographic territory there's pretty much no utility to that maybe there's some kind of novel experiences that could come out of something like that but there's virtually no reason no compelling reason to just limit the overall pool of land. And our bet really is what, what is worth optimizing for is not this like replication of a you know, normal city. Instead, it is about user generated content. The metaverse, these open game worlds are going to be as good as the content that gets produced on them. And when you look at Minecraft or Roblox, particularly Roblox, what's great about Roblox is people produce lots of cool content. Similarly, what's great about YouTube is that people produce lots of great content. And if you took either of those platforms and introduced a scarce land mechanism to it, it's pretty clear that they would be worse. If there was only 100,000 YouTube accounts and you had to buy one, there'd be less content on YouTube. If there was a scarce land design in Roblox, it would be a worse game. And that doesn't mean that Web3 doesn't have anything new to bring to gaming. It does, but it has to be about 
improving on models for getting users to create great content, not taking a step backwards. And so I'll stop there, but that's kind of the overall frame is we've arrived at this status quo, not because of first principles reasoning, but because of sort of memes and just momentum. And it actually is a material step backwards in terms of optimizing games for user generated content and cool creation. Um, which is the only real purpose of these open game worlds is user generated content. Yeah, so. and Charles, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think, uh, you know, overwhelmingly, we as an industry have kind of missed the boat on this one. Uh, you know, it, it seems like we have, uh, you know, unintentionally a lot of operators have adjusted for a uh, an upfront raise right because you can sell like a ton mm -hmm. of land or you can you know you can you can sell some of this this digital scarcity which may or may not pan out long term but it sounds great right and it raises a ton of money um and you know it, it comes with that added bit of complexity of having to actually deliver to users but how do you deliver to users when you've cut off a lot of your network effects because you know your users can't actually use the land because they don't have access to that gameplay element because they can't afford it right and so you've kind of shot yourself in the foot um to you know to to play devil's advocate for just one second, right? I'm, I'm glad you actually mentioned World of Warcraft because World of Warcraft does have certain components where everyone has their own bit of unlimited land, right? But then parts of World of Warcraft are not unlimited, right? So like each uh, major city has its own auction house, right? And there's only one auction house. And, you know, you could imagine a world in the future where that one auction house is actually owned by someone. And in a, in a game environment like an MMORPG with the explicit intention of having a constrained game world environment that kind of mimics real world, that is one scenario where I could actually see a case for digital scarcity to be made, right? Like there is only one Stormwind. There's only one Stormwind. There's only one auction house inside of Stormwind, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I'm curious to take, get your take on that because to me, overwhelmingly, the status quo should be don't do digital scarcity. However, under certain contexts, it would make sense that some of these things perhaps could be digitally scarce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, it's not that we're against I, digital items having property rights or being scarce in some way, but it should always be that if you're ascribing property rights to a digital asset, it should do something. It should motivate people to do something that is productive and makes the game world better or the service better, whatever it is. Um, and so in the case of like a Roblox or a Minecraft, I think they're really clear cut cases where limiting the amount that people can create or limiting the spaces people can create in just decreases the total amount of content. And if that's mainly what people are there for, like with Roblox, they're there to see these different game experiences. If there are less game experiences, the game is worse. And you know, you're optimizing for the wrong things. Uh, with a game like a, like a role-playing game or something that is not about user-generated content. So yeah, World of Warcraft, not a user-generated content platform. It's a multiplayer game where people are kind of pursuing you know, doing some PVP stuff and they're going along a kind of long extended campaign uh, that's like PV. There's no UGC element. So I would say that like some, like what should be, what you should do is whatever's scarce in that world, you'd want to assign scarcity to things that makes that experience more compelling. So it might be like rare items or potentially some territory in the game could be owned and could be tradable or it could be fought over. So I think if it motivates players to go and pursue like the PVE campaign more aggressively, if it causes players to fight each other over territory and there's some value to that territory that motivates people to engage with the game more deeply, that would be cool. I could see it. Um, I think maybe the most definite thing I can say is while, you know, you could ascribe, it's just, it's just that if you ascribe scarcity, it should motivate people to, it should enhance the like core value proposition of the title. And so maybe World of Warcraft, there's something you could do there when it comes to like a Minecraft or a Roblox like platform. If UGC is the end goal, limiting people's ability to produce content is just counterproductive. I, Charles, I, I think that's a fantastic take. It actually ties in very well with an article we put out last week around, you know, driving your Web3 components towards your KPIs. At the end of the day, each thing that we put out in Web3 is still a product, right? And so it's got to be a killer product. And, you know, if you engage in something like, you know, some forms of staking or some forms of land sale or land hoarding, and all that it does is it caters to a speculative environment, but it doesn't actually improve your network effects. It doesn't improve your MAUs, your core KPIs. There's no point for it to kind of exist, right? And, you know, 
obviously land being a very hypey area in general, kind of lends itself really well to that type of speculative effects. Everyone thinks it's going to be the best New York real estate, right? So yeah, so it, you know, in that context, when, what I hear you talking about there is, you know, kind of this importance of network work effects in Web3 and, you know, we can better leverage things that accomplish that without having to resort to things like, you know, artificial digital scarcity, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's, you don't want to limit players' ability to enjoy what's good about a game, basically. Um, or, or, or especially if your platform, basically all value in it is what users create, then you don't want to limit people's ability to create. And then what, what's interesting is like, once you kind of discard that as a starting point, if you say, okay, let's say, you know, right now the market's betting that platforms like, you know, Sandbox or Decentraland, Nifty Island, you know, Webiverse, whatever, like that these are kind of, this is the markets right now betting that that's a big category. And I think that's right because it is, these are platforms that could become like anything over time. If users create enough content, they could be these like mega games, kind of like Roblox. That's kind of what, why they, people ascribe so much value to them. I think that's correct. But, and, and when you discard the scarce land model as a starting point, you start to think, how could we ascribe property rights and digital scarcity to other things that might motivate more user-generated content? I really look at it like if we took it on like there's a negative one-to-one -one scale and we said like platforms like YouTube and Roblox are the status quo, they're a zero. They're user-generated content platforms where people make a bit of money, but it's hard to make money and they're not perfect. Uh, I would say... You know, a negative one on the scale would be like a scarce land metaverse where it's actually just, there's no real way to monetize content. I'm not aware of a monetization model for any of these scarce land metaverses. And in fact, there's a cost to, to buy in and to produce content. So it really is like a significant step back from like YouTube or Roblox, where at least a small percent of creators make a lot of money. And then the goal should be to discover what a one looks like. What, how can Web3 allow more creators to make a living producing great content? And if we can do that, then more people produce content on Web3 native platforms than traditional ones. And that's how you have like a better game. And so just that's how I think about it. That's, that's what I think is like worth pursuing is discovering what's in that. Zero, let's discard that negative one space and let's start thinking about that like zero to one space, which is, you know, ascribing better incentives to user generated content. Yeah, agreed. And again, it all comes back to incentivizing your audience to use your product in a way that does at the end support your, you know, your core KPIs. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with you across the board. You know, uh, kind of to that end, right, we end up with this dichotomy between investors and players, right? So you have your speculative class, you have your player class. And, you know, in, in my mind, even if we go, you know, kind of to that full one in your scenario, right, where we have like a, a pure UGC utopia, you know, maybe the, the land and the assets start free, but then like users pour time and talent into them and they grow into something beautiful and then that's worth value. Um, at the end there, you do still end up with speculation. It's not necessarily bad, right? Because maybe the creator gets, you know, cash out of it. They, they end up financially incentivized to continue to create. That's great. But, you know, this, this idea that Web3 kind of ties in these financial incentives into the gameplay loop really makes all of this so much more complex. Because, you know, after you deploy a game, it's very, very difficult for you to then go back and change it because now you, you're playing with people's livelihoods, right? Um, so, you know, what would, you know, what would you recommend even? And this is an impossible question, so I apologize in advance. But, you know, for some of these folks who have deployed, you know, digitally scarce land, and maybe they're looking at that, uh, you know, a couple months out into the future, and they're like, well, we, we kind of like the idea ideas of, you know, digital abundance instead. I wish we could map it more into that. Do you have any ideas, you know, how could someone like the sandbox, for example, introduce the idea of digital abundance into a world which is already constrained by digital scarcity? Yeah, I think it'll be tough because everything you issue is like a promise more or less, right? There are implicit promises that holders of these assets have. And so any, any change you make is going to be, uh, difficult. Uh, so I mean, but I think basically the direction that they could explore would be something like making that land some sort of a premium experience and then having like a free to play version that kind of goes alongside it. I'm sure they've considered this. That would make sense to me. That would be a direction you could go in. Uh, but the way people are valuing these assets, it would be, you're, you're stuck in a difficult situation because if you create a free to play version that is more or less as good as the like, you know, million dollar land holding version. Um, then it's unclear why that land has any value at all. Right. Uh, and if you make the free to play version 
sort of really constrained such that you risk people not wanting to uh, play it. And so that's there. It's a tough, tough one, but that's the direction I would, I would move in. Um, Yeah. And then I'll say too, like uh, the, like having financial consequences in games is good. And I think, and like the speculative dimension of people's desire to make money in a game is a really powerful one. And I think we've kind of backpedaled or swung too far against that now because you had Axie, which like exploded in popularity and everyone was all about play to earn. And now with like Axie kind of cooling off to some degree, everyone's sort of back, not everyone, but like some, you see some amount of backpedaling where it's like, Oh, okay. Play and earn like, okay. Like maybe this wasn't a good idea. And I still think there's a core of what happened with Axie that's like totally right, which is like bringing financial consequence to games is incredibly powerful. And there will be ways to do it that doesn't rely on the sort of like permanent user growth that they, that they relied on, whereby people had to continue demanding new axes for people to be able to sell the token that allows people to breed new axes. So, yeah. So I think financial consequence and like play to earn stuff, I think it still makes sense. And I, I'm not really, I think that's great. Uh, and then for these platforms that have issued land, like, which is not even really a play to earn model. It's, uh, I think they bit, you basically want to try and move to like a premium and a freemium and a free version. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I love that entire string of thoughts. First of all, I, I agree almost entirely across the board, right? Like, you know, Axie was a killer use case. Okay. It was a great first attempt, but that economy was not well modeled. I mean, people saw this from the beginning, right? Like uh, this was going to be problematic. Um, but the, the core of it that's there that like you can provably redistribute certain revenues or certain incentives on blockchain in a neat little gamified fashion, that's going to be the like a real killer application that'll persist. I also like that you brought up Axie for a second reason because you brought it up and then you also said free to play a couple sentences before. So what Axie has done is Axie also is introducing a free to play component, sort of, mm-hmm. right? So they have like these starter Axies, you can play the game, you can have fun. Um, and I think you're right. I think you, you ultimately have something that looks like a, a Web3 or almost a premium component it, that people opt in and there are some sort of financial wrappers around it maybe a way to earn and then these games also have like a mirrored version that sits in web 2 mm-hmm. and in the web 2 experience like it's a free-to-play experience it's what we're used to etc um because i i agree you know it, it almost feels like forcing people to pay for a game and assets up front i mean that's like that's like back to the 1990s right like buying diablo mm-hmm. 2 as a like a box set right like you're not yeah. you, you don't do that anymore you 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 download fortnite and fall guys for free and you have fun for 48 hours and then you're like yeah that was sick right and you maybe buy 40 dollars mm-hmm. With the skins while you do it that's the monetization model and that's where the industry will go back to um so it, you know and, and this is kind of a really really long-winded way of getting to this but um you know axi has imploded into the state that it is right now partially because there was not a robust economic model um something that we can talk about here today you know with respect to digital land scarcity etc you know economics and finances around it something that i'm fond of and a lot of people are coming around to as well are these ideas of digital land taxes right and different ways that you can actually apply a tax to certain forms of land to either encourage user engagement or to discourage certain amounts of speculative activity that just destroy games because digital land has actually existed in games like you know for for two decades now probably we've had digital land and um you know game designers have been trying to solve this over and over and over and overwhelmingly a lot of them seem to agree that digital land taxes might actually be a good way to do it because you encourage people to actually engage and to build on top of the the components so i'm curious mm-hmm. what your thoughts are around that that's kind of a complex and broader economic topic yeah. but you know where do you sit on that yeah so i i this is one where i like i think people are kind of starting on a faulty premise and then trying to bend over backwards to find a way to make it workable, which is like, Oh, what if we have scarce digital land, but there's some sort of penalty for not using it. Right. That's, or, or people will say, what if we build a rental market, you know, Oh, you can rent land out and, and then it will go to builders who want to use it and monetize it somehow. Um, this for me is like, you know, it's still, that still for me gets away from like, why do you have this constraint in the first place? Uh, and I do think when you look at like the real world, again, scarce land is like the ultimate source of like rent seeking and like counterproductive activities. Like having lots of abundant, like cheap land is like a huge boon to productivity. And when you look at like, you know, really like mature economies, big cities that have like a extremely overbought up, uh, you know, real estate market, like it's a source of rent seeking. There are people who just sit on the land, charge rent to other people who are trying to come to the city to make things. It's, it's still not a great model, I think. Um, 
So, so yeah, I think people are kind of working backwards there. I think there are other things you can do that are interesting. Like for me and with the direction we're going in is that you can have an Island for free. Um, you can, you can enter this game world, build your own space, have people play games on it. And over time, we think that there'll be games with financial consequence that occur on these islands. And you should let people who have an island take some percent of that as like a sort of tax rate. And if you have a really compelling experience you've built out and people love spending time on there and they love transacting there, you know, whether that's like kind of doing some sort of wagering on a game of skill or engaging in a play to earn experience in your island, then you should be able to take a tax rate. And then what that does is it encourages someone to share their island, get people to visit it and see your platform as something they can run a business on. Um, so that, that for me is the right direction is there's no cost to like getting in the game. Um, and there's new ways of monetizing. Uh, so if people are doing play to earn experiences, if you're facilitating some sort of wagering on a game of skill, kind of like experience on your Island, you should be able to take a cut. That, that, that's like the opposite of scarce land for me free and actually intensely like, you know, is very much has like abundant possibilities for monetization. Yeah. And I, I think this, you know, again, going all the way back to first principles, asking ourselves, why is it scarce in the first place, et cetera, over and over. Yeah. I think it's a good way to start. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I'm also glad that you moved on to a little bit UGC here because that's actually my, my next topic. You know, um, Roblox, obviously the, the big, big player in the room here uh, has made a killing off UGC. Right. So it's a. Uh, uh, it, it is or was, a, you know, a stock market darling there for a hot second, and it, it continues to produce robust revenue, right? Um, so I'm curious around, you know, how you guys are thinking of, you know, uh, leveraging UGC both as Nifty Island yourself, right, as either an entity or a token, whatever you guys happen to be doing, uh, you know, as well as financially incentivizing your users to create. So Roblox's model, uh, you know, I, I may get this wrong here, but I, I believe that Roblox takes 70%, the user gets something like 30%. Where are you? guys you know kind of sitting around that and if there are even yeah. numbers that you're willing to share you know what can people expect yeah so ours will be very different from roblox uh so um for us we're really looking at like open as the model where there's a couple different parts of the ugc model that we're building out over time i guess that they each work a little differently so First, there's the production of cool 3D assets that people want to have on their island. So if people are building these cool sort of game spaces, they want objects to make them really unique and customizable. That's going to look a lot like OpenSea, where it's like people are creating these assets, maybe they're ascribing their own royalties, but we're taking like 2.5% or something like that. Um, so that's going to be pretty low. And then the other side will be you know, the creation of game logic. So if people are making their own custom games and people are then deploying them on their island, and if those games have financial throughput, they should be able to take some cut of it. Um, and finally, if people are, yeah, wagering on those games, we, it, the, basically the people who should profit from that are us as the platform. Uh, the like person who has the island that sort of pulled together these pieces and developed a community that wants to play games together and then the creator of the game logic. And so I, that all though comes to a fraction like of what Roblox is charging. So that's our intention is probably to do something in like the, you know, 5%, 10% take on like financial throughput through the games. And then we don't take all of that. We would share it with the person that has the island that's drawing in users, the person who's created the game logic, and then some of it goes to us as the platform so we can keep producing and stuff. That's how we think about it, yeah. No, Charles, I, I love that. And it's, it's always fun for me to noodle around on these things, right? Because part of Web3 is this ethos of, you know, decentralization, disintermediation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when I think that, you know, as someone who's kind of sat in some of these big bank offices, et cetera, in these corporate structures, et cetera, uh, you know, you, you, you cut out a lot of the middle office and the back office, right? Blockchain becomes your accounting function, right? And some of these other middleware open source tools become, you know, uh, some, some things that you would normally have a whole proprietary tech team to spin up. And because of that, you can generally keep, at least in my estimation, your operational costs and your R&D costs lower than you may be able to at some of these big corporate conglomerates. Mm -hmm. So that's what's got me really fired up about, you know, like Web3 and blockchain gaming in general is because these are tools that we just didn't have before. Like no yeah. one had these things. This is, this is a big one. And when you talk to people who are running games, uh, like traditional games, 
and say they have like a kind of marketplace UGC model, you'll have a pla so say you have a game that is like distributing through Epic or Steam, and then they have like they may have some backend provider that's allowing that that's running their marketplace and like making it function, and then they have a payment processor that's dealing with credit cards and between those like three or four actors, and then of course there's the game itself, between those three or four actors, you get to a point where uh, the, like, the fees and the, um, the take rate that these games have to charge to be viable is like incredibly high. Uh, so it is, it's, it's like it is, it's always, it tends to be around like that over 50% somewhere in that there's like a 50% tax on production. Uh, just across the board, which is just obviously going to lead to less uh, content. And then, of course, the other side of it is that those assets that are produced are not have no interoperability. They like don't have any existence, like you know, that's alienable from the platform. And so, people ascribe a lower value to them. Uh, so, when you combine the fact that consumers are likely to want to spend more on a Clonex than they are on like an avatar that is only in one game. And you add into the mix that you can cut out these third-party service providers and just settle on chain. I think you're in a position where the costs of running like a UGC platform are lower, and the amount that consumers are willing to spend on each asset is higher. And that, like, that's that's fundamentally what's like interesting about this. I think. Yeah. 100%. And then you tie in the facts that the users are actually partially the owners of the platform and incentivized to create those network effects. Yeah. And I, I, I just, I, I don't see the cat going back in the back, you know, blockchain gaming, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one direction from here, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. Like that's, I really think of like crypto as basically being what, well, what, what exists here is like we have digitally native, like very flexible, easy to deploy property rights. Like that's, that's, yeah, that's kind of all it is. And then, and then, the question, there's always been this vision of like, oh, people are going to put their house on chain and they're going to like, you know, put their car on chain or something like that. And that's kind of like less what I'm excited about in the near term, because basically when you like, you know, like with your house, like it's really worth having a lawyer pour over the documents for your house. And it's worth having a bank, like put money in escrow. And then when you buy it, you know, releasing it, like it's all that cumbersome stuff is pretty worthwhile because the real world is slow and cumbersome. And like, if things go wrong, it's really costly. And when you look at like digital spaces, like in games, there are places where imagine having a lawyer draft up a contract for someone to like, you know, start a business within a game world or like, you know, or putting, or, or, or putting money in escrow or something to buy an expensive game asset. Like, suddenly none of it really makes sense. Like none of it maps because the property rights are too slow and cumbersome and costly to enforce, uh, for this like really fast paced, like light kind of crazy environment. And so like where web three makes sense is in a game because like it, it is like what we're offering are property rights that are in some ways worse, like they're less enforceable and you know, they, uh, they have like certain wonkiness to deploy but they are really cheap to spin up. Like it's a lot easier to start a wallet address than an LLC. Like, and it's a lot easier to spin up a token than it is to like draft up some legal document about who owns what. So, um, yeah, and, yeah. And Charles, I would even take it one step further. I would say that they are maybe only flimsy in the near term while people are still developing really robust smart contracts. But I like that people ordinarily forget that the last part of that word is contract. And when you engage with a smart contract, it really is an agreement between two parties. You both can read the agreement if you were so inclined and you can operate under that same set of rules. Um, so no, I, again, I, I agree across the board. I, I think that's a fantastic take. Charles, uh, I've just got one broad question left here for you. And then I'll ask if you got anything you want to chat to your community about real quick. And then we'll wrap it up. But as you know, just kind of a general piece of advice here, right? So you're an active participant in Web3 Ventures in general. What kind of advice do you have for other Web3 builders in the space, you know, who might be trying to spin up their own projects? Do you have any major regrets or maybe any revelations that you, you know, really want to share around what works and what doesn't? Yeah, I think, uh, I think like the critical balance, if you're trying to like, again, you know, we're, we're still proving our points. So like, I'll give, you know, take the advice with a grain of salt, but, um, like, I, I really think that the balance I think of a lot is both, it's like trying to build things like on first principles and not getting caught up in like trends that don't make sense because things shift so quickly. Like people can be like so enamored with a particular concept or way of doing things. And then you flash forward two years in the future and like people are like thinking completely differently. Like I can remember being in the space when I was working like on a DeFi project called Reserve uh, back in like 20, 
18, 19 to 20. Um, and there were people just enamored with like the concept of like a Bitcoin killer. Like it was like, okay, Decred is like the future. And there were like long blog posts about it. And it's really worth just remembering how wrong the market consensus can be. And like the power of price go up, goes up, like means that people will just post hoc rationalize ideas that don't make sense, like all the time. So that's like the kind of thing to be wary of. But then the kind of balance to that is that you need to build things that like kind of respect where the market is at. Like you can't, you know, like it's, so with this gaming space, like people do want alpha and people do want, like there is a speculative dimension to this and there's no way, like you shouldn't detach from that because it's so much where the market is at. So it's like you want to build on, for, it's like about balancing, like am I building on first principles, things that make sense? And am I, do I have a path that meets the market where it is? You know, that's kind of the two things I try to balance. And, you know, that's probably the most high level advice I can give that applies to anyone trying to build in the space. No, Charles, I think that's great across the board, man. Um, solid advice for any builder trying to look in, uh, look into the space right now. Um, do you have any other final comments across anything we talked about? Uh, anything you'd like to shout out here at the end? Yeah. Um, let's see. I just say like, we're, you know, if anyone's excited about like, you know, building, especially like 3d assets in an open game world, we're looking for more 3d artists to join the community and start experimenting with stuff. We're going to have our 3d asset creation tools in our marketplace. We'll go into a sort of closed alpha to accompany the game, which is also in closed alpha, uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. So it'd be great. If anyone wants to experiment with those tools, hit us up. That'd be great. And yeah, I just say, yeah, grateful to the, to the community that supported us so far. And um, yeah, we're just excited to try and get the full platform out soon. All right. Love to see it. Charles, no, we will, uh, we'll certainly at least send some players over there. And uh, I know folks are really curious about poking around. So no, uh, stoked to have you on today, Charles. Thanks a bunch for coming out. Uh, folks, uh, appreciate it. If you haven't checked out Nifty Island yet, please do. It is a very interesting project with a great core ethos and team. Uh, so let's, uh, let's give them a hand there. All right. Thanks, Charles. You have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate you.